now for Brian Koberger, the man accused of stabbing four University of Idaho students to death last November. Koberger's lawyers now want to know exactly how investigators were able to gather Koberger's DNA that they say placed him at the scene of the crime. Investigators used a process called investigative genetic genealogy or IgG to collect DNA from another source and ultimately match it to the DNA on a knife sheath found at the crime scene near the bodies of two of the victims, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan. This DNA match is possibly the prosecutor's strongest piece of evidence against Koberger. Koberger's lawyers say they need the information to help prepare their defense. But the prosecution argues they didn't use IgG to obtain any warrants. And they're concerned unknown relatives' identities will be made public if the genetic genealogy gets out there. In his order last week, the judge stated to balance the interests of the defense and prosecution, he will review all of the IgG information the state and FBI have. He will then decide what does and does not need to be disclosed. To set a deadline for uh, all the information to be provided to the court by December 1st. Um, that should be sufficient time. The clock is ticking for prosecutors in the University of Idaho quadruple murders case as a judge implements a new deadline for the state to hand over DNA evidence to be used in the trial. It seems like this is really just the beginning of the process. In a last minute hearing on Thursday, Judge John Judge gave accused murderer Brian Koberger a win when he implemented a December 1st deadline. That means prosecutors have just under a month to turn over genetic genealogy and DNA evidence to the defense. Brian Enton, a senior national correspondent with News Nation, was in the courtroom on Thursday. He tells Long Crime Network the entire hearing centered around genetic evidence the defense is hoping to get its hands on. Basically, the reports have to go to the judge first to review. There's a lot of confidential information that could possibly be in these reports because they involve like family trees of people who are totally unconnected to the case. Uh, so the judge has to review the reports first um, and then will decide what to give to the defense. But the judge hasn't even gotten the reports yet. Uh, came out in court today. Um, the prosecutor said that they're still waiting on reports from the FBI. It's turning into this really long process. And so the new deadline for the judge to get the reports is now December 1st. Now remember, DNA evidence is a big part of the state's case. That's how they tied Koberger to the murders in the first place. Investigators used DNA from a knife sheath left behind at the crime scene to track down Koberger. They compared DNA from Koberger's father, gathered from his trash all the way in Pennsylvania, to that found on the sheath in Idaho. They quickly determined it was a match, and later investigators scored a near-perfect match when a cheek swab from Koberger himself was collected this summer. But as for the evidence discussed in Thursday's hearing, it's still a question mark. Did they give any like specific examples of what this evidence could be? No, they didn't get into specifics, but it's, it's interesting because it's kind of like a new science. The judge today alluded in court to the fact that this hasn't been used in Idaho cases much before, maybe ever before. Um, so it's new to him. Um, and it, it's interesting. I mean, if you remember basically they, uh, when they found the DNA on the knife sheath uh, at the murder scene, they then used this investigative genetic genealogy um, to go back, like, you know, 23andMe and these companies where you give your DNA, they can get access to those databases. And that's how they narrowed down the suspect pool to um, get to Brian Koberger. It's been nearly one year since the four University of Idaho students were found brutally murdered. On November 13th of 2022, Moscow officials received a 911 call reporting someone unconscious in a home near campus. First responders found the bodies of Zana Kernodal, Ethan Chapin, Madison Mogan, and Kaylee Gonzalez stabbed to death. It wasn't until weeks later in late December when Koberger was arrested. Detectives arrested 28-year-old Brian Christopher Koberger in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania on a warrant for murder of Ethan, Zena, Madison, and Kaylee. Koberger was taken into custody at his parents' home in Pennsylvania and then later extradited to Idaho. 
Since then, he's been held at the Lataw County Jail in Moscow, less than two miles from the crime scene. That's where he appeared virtually to Thursday's court hearing. I couldn't see him, but he appeared via Zoom with his lawyer. The camera on the Zoom was focused on his lawyer and Taylor. They were in the basement below the courtroom, which is where the jail is. There's a small jail uh, here in Lake Talk County. Did they make any mention as to why it was via Zoom and not in person if they were so close? Uh, they've done this before with Zoom when it's more of a scheduling hearing and not something really significant. Uh, they'll do the hearing on Zoom, just, I think, more as convenience for all the parties involved. We're already in the process of making sure we've gathered uh, everything uh, from the private contract um, um, DNA company. Uh, so we'll have that ready to submit uh, along with what we received from the FBI once we get it. As part of the hearing, Enton says prosecutors noted they're working with both the FBI and a private lab to receive information. It sounded like they were having an easier time getting the reports from the private lab, uh, but the delay really seems to be uh, with the FBI. The prosecutor said that before the FBI can send the report, they had to get permission from the DOJ. Uh, so it, it's just turning into like a really, really long process. Does it sound like something prosecutors are confident can happen in less than a month, have all of these reports ready to go? No, they did not sound that confident to me in court today. I, it sounds like they're, you know, sort of at the mercy of the FBI. Uh, the prosecutor uh, said that he was going to call the FBI again today and try to push them along. But but they say that they're waiting on the FBI to send them the report so that they can then send the reports to the judge. When that information does finally come down, the judge will have to review it. And it's possible he could deem some of the information inadmissible. In the order addressing IDD DNA. I also understand that the state and the defense have different lists. So I will look at it and we'll, you know, I'll muddle through it as best I can. He's going to have a lot to go through the judge to figure out if there is any confidential information that's basically irrelevant and that the defense doesn't need to see. Um, I, I think it's possible that some of the stuff could be redacted. Uh, but again, this is this is all new for the judge. I mean, he said that today. It's complicated. This um, IgG investigative genetic genealogy. Uh, he may even need like an expert to possibly help him understand it all. They may even need to have another hearing where he is able to ask questions. Uh, so it, it seems like this is really just the beginning of the process. And we've also talked about the prosecution a lot here, um, talking about the information that they're hoping to gain from the FBI. But did the defense speak up at all about anything? Yeah, the defense is frustrated. I mean, it came through today in court. They've been waiting on these reports. Uh, they feel like it's about time they got them and were able to go through them. Um, and, you know, it's becoming clear that this, this uh, IgG, this investigative genetic genealogy, this DNA, is something that's important to the defense that's going to be probably a pivotal part of the defense that, that they put on a trial. I'm hoping that the court will do is just create of this or a log and what the court receives, not the detail of the content, but things like the raw data SNP profile from Optrum, the communications between Optrum and the FBI, not the content, just that you have those, the statistical analysis that happened within the profiles when making decisions, when the genetic genealogists made the SIP about the family tree, that you have the statistical analysis that you have the bioinformatics or the microarray, that you have access to those things, that, that's it. Meanwhile, just this week, FBI agents headed back to the scene of the crime to collect more information for the coming trial. Yeah, we were out there. We saw the FBI going into the house. Um, kind of came as a surprise because, you know, we were under the assumption that they didn't need the house anymore. The prosecution had signed off on the house being demolished. The families of the victims fought that and uh, kind of came as a surprise when um, the FBI showed back up at the house. Uh, they were going in and out for two days. They did 3D imaging of the house, so they had specialized equipment that they went through each room uh, to basically model. They had a drone up over the house. They took all the boards off of the house, um, and they were really busy for two days out there. Agents spent October 31st and November 1st at the King Road home, collecting images and measurements for a 3D model to be used at trial. 
Former FBI agent Colin Schmidt told Long Crime Network the information will be invaluable to prosecutors. This was such a horrific, horrific crime. The prosecutors there, they want to get it right. And you only get one chance in front of a jury to get it right. You, 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 can't, you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So they have this opportunity to put this evidence in front of the jury that is going to be exact, absolute precise depiction of what happened so the jury understands how horrific this was and how well, how he did what he did because there is quite a few questions about well how could he go in and do these things and and the other the survivors didn't hear him or didn't understand or didn't uh step up and stop him from doing this well this 3d model is going to show the jury well this is how he did it this is how he was able to get away with doing these horrific things without anybody hearing him as he was uh, basically executing his victims. And it's still possible future jurors could visit the scene of the crime. And, and I anticipate that's going to happen. And there's going to be an argument by the defense not to see this 3D modeling before they walk through, because then the, the defense is going to say they're being biased by what the, the FBI's depiction or of the, the crime scene. So I'm sure the jurors are going to want to see what happened there. They're going to walk through. They're only going to see basically completely empty rooms. I mean, the carpet's going to be ripped up because the FBI is going to pull a lot of that carpet, take it back to the lab, and go through it with in a microscopic manner. Uh, so I don't. They're not, in my opinion, they're not going to get a lot of context from these empty rooms. I think the the 3D modeling is going to give them a lot more context. Uh, but I anticipate that even though there there's going to be argument why you're not going to get anything out, I think the jurors are still want to go just to see, you know, just to, in their own mind, hey, what really happened? Welcome back to my mental health and crime channel. My name is Hoodie London. This is for entertainment purpose only. The FBI had 48 hours between the 30th and 31st, sorry, actually, the 31st October to the 1st November, they had 48 hours to take the 3D pictures of this house and videos that they needed to present, present it to the courts. So they came back, they took out the windows of Maddie's room, the living room, and they boarded it up. I've heard some people discussing about why the FBI went there without mask and without the forensic team. The, I personally believe the FBI, FBI has different teams. They have their own forensic team, but the part of the forensic team taking evidence is already done with. That was in the beginning of this case 11 and a half months ago. So I don't think the FBI came here to gather any more evidence. They're done with that. That's the reason they do not have masks. They said clearly that they came here to take 3D pictures and videos inside and outside the crime scene. So they had 48 hours for that. Some people may find it wrong. Some people may find it wrong that they came without any forensic gear. But I don't find it wrong. There's nothing in that. They don't need to be masked up or geared up because this is the FBI digital team. This is not the forensic team. And I don't believe there's any more forensics inside the house that they want to gather because they gathered over 2,000, I believe, evidence on the crime scene in the beginning of this case. So that is what I personally believe because a couple of people was asking me in the comment channel why wasn't the FBI wearing their kit? And I've seen other creators talking about that, but I wouldn't have taken that into a big issue because the FBI are the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They know what they wear and they know what they don't wear. 
They usually don't wear a kit when the crime scene pictures have already been taken. Of course, there could be still forensics inside there, but I believe they have taken what they needed. And they said they're going to take the carpet so that they put it under a microscope and get what they need, if there's any more DNA. I'm just surprised that it took such a lengthy time. Why would they come back after 11 and a half months? It makes me believe that they don't have a strong case. Now they have to turn over, over the DNA, uh, DNA, genealogical DNA roadmap that brought them to accuse Mr. Brian Christopher Kohlberg of this crime. Yeah, we can see the FBI officer there without the forensic team's kit, but it's because they've taken the forensic. And they came to build a model 